do you think that AI will put philosophers out of business? Seems like there's already a tough time getting a job as a philosopher. Lord willing, I'll go on to do a PhD in philosophy, finishing up a master's here. Is there going to be any <laughs> jobs left? Like there's, it's already a tough marketplace, but is AI going to take over and uh, put philosophers out of a job? I don't know. Maybe in the future they will write theses for us. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, 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 I teach a course on ethics of AI, and one of the things I discuss is automation and if you will lose your, our jobs or not, or if you will should decide about our jobs. If you are, if we, if if we should proof our jobs, AI proof, see if it, our jobs will be. Mm -hmm. Could it be protected or not? And there is one website you can uh, describe your your career, the things you're doing, and they will say, do, they'll predict if huh. uh, AI will replace this or not. Is it AI uh, the and prediction? I, uh, it's an algorithm that does the prediction, oh, but that's so the prediction. Be yeah. <laughs> but based, based in, in what kind of profession? Uh, would require some kinds of abilities that the system, the, the algorithms don't have. So this idea that if you have some, if your activity requires lots of, of uh, relationships that require some emotional components, uh, things that we have to interact with other humans in uh, intersubjective or care, uh, professions that require some, some care relations, uh, but also, uh, I go to the website, and they usually say that that academics and teachers will be always yeah, they are protected from this. Okay, that's but nice. all this, all this was before GPT four. <laughs> okay, that's, so now that's... GPT four, we don't know. Probably right. will. I, yeah. I'm not completely confident yeah. because they they might very fast overcome our capacity yeah. to. Uh, to do all sorts of, of cognitive operations we have been doing. Uh, I think philosophy that, uh, I think for philosophy, we ask fundamental questions. So I don't know, it might still have a job for I us. So. Yeah, I, uh, so. I don't know if we will have academic jobs because probably they right. will teach our problems better than us. But yeah. I, maybe, maybe what, I don't know, some questions about life and death, some questions about religion, mm -hmm. uh, some questions about what yet what is ethical or not. Yeah. Maybe this will be if they don't if they're not conscious, maybe they won't be able to discuss the same level of uh, deep level we have when when discuss those those these, those issues. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setacase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is super special. We're going to be talking about uh, the distribution problem in consciousness, consciousness studies, research, science, all that stuff. What kind of things are conscious? How can we know? Are infants conscious? Uh, it seems like they are. A lot of us take them to be. We probably ought to. But how can we tell? How do we know if a, if a infant is conscious? Well, they're crying when they're in pain. Well, are they in pain? How do we know? I have with me Dr. Claudia Passos, Dr. Doctor. She's double PhD. And she specializes in this. She gave a talk at MindFest 2023 down at FAU, Florida Atlantic University for MindFest. Uh, and she, she was on a panel. We've had some of the other panelists on, so you can find those as well. Um, all about infant consciousness and how we can know and what ramifications or implications these kind of tests could have for AI research and synthetic consciousness. So I'm really excited to jump into that. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon. Uh, if you guys like this podcast, if you want to see more episodes on awesome ideas and concepts like we're about to get into, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can find the link in the description wherever you get in this podcast at. You can also, if you're on YouTube, become a YouTube member. Same thing, same perks. Uh, there's all sorts of different like rewards at different levels of support. I appreciate you guys. I want to do this full time. And because of supporters like you, I was able to go down to Florida for MindFest and get to know Claudia a little bit more and invite her on this podcast. So I appreciate you guys. Every little bit helps the podcast and helps you come think with me. 
So let's jump in with Dr. Claudia Passos and talk about infant consciousness and maybe some AI as well. <clears throat> Claudia, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, hi, Parker. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is great. Uh, it was really great meeting you down uh, at Florida Atlantic University for MindFest, and I really enjoyed uh, your part of the panel discussion and your presentation. Before we jump in on the subject of consciousness in general and uh, infant and AI consciousness in particular, uh, I'd love my audience. I'd love for my audience to get to know you a little bit more. Um, you have two PhDs. Can you tell us, like, how did you get into philosophy and, and psychological research type stuff, um, and then come to study, you know, consciousness? How did you get into it? Yeah, uh, so since undergraduate, I was always interested in uh, philosophical questions, more uh, fundamental questions. But I was also very curious about uh, the clinical uh, aspect of psychology. So I did my undergraduate study in psychology, mm -hmm. and I was trained in clinical psychology, uh, also trained in psychoanalysis, and practiced this for many years. Uh, and I think although uh, I, uh, I moved uh, a lot my academic trajectory, uh, I still think most of my interesting questions uh, comes from this, uh, this past of the clinical psychology uh, experience. So I think it gave me lots of uh, interesting insights about the human mind and what matters in, the, uh, in those discussions. Uh, so I, my first PhD was in an interdisciplinary area, was on public health, but my de but the department in public health I was my concentration, the concentration of my PhD. Actually, I got a master and PhD in the, in the same department. Mm. I was um, human science, uh, uh, maybe the, the, the best translation in concentration in public health in the U.S. would be... Um, uh, social and behavioral science concentration. And I was uh, uh, involved with a group that uh, was doing a kind of, uh, the, was a group uh, involved with the mental health, and they were uh, doing a kind of history of psychiatry or philosophy of psychiatry. So I was very curious about models of mind that could help in psychopathology. And I did this, uh, I did a lot of research in this area for, for many years. And in this, in my curriculum, in this, uh, with this, uh, in this PhD, there was lots of bioethics too, uh, lots of discussion about medical ethics practice uh, and how uh, philosophy could inform us uh, about uh, some issues, some ethical issues related to how to treat patients. Okay, so this this was my first PhD, and my thesis in this first PhD was a read uh, related to the mind that was. Uh, very interested how we developed our introspective thoughts, how we uh, grew up with this mind that is, has some internal or inner capacity of reflect about our own mind. So I was much more interested to uh, uh, make a comparison with my current work with the self-consciousness aspect of our mind. So I start with this interest in self-consciousness. And how, but I also, I was not just interested in self-consciousness per se, but I was interested in how we develop as a self-conscious creature. So what are the origins of our uh, self-conscious process? And, and I, I try to, this thesis to, to approach this topic, trying to propose a kind of external model of how our introspection develops. And then after this uh, this PhD, I I started a, a, a project uh, in, a, in the Department of Philosophy in the in the, uh, in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it was an interdisciplinary project on ethics and biotechnology. So I in this uh, uh, postdoc, I I did a lot of research on how. Uh, uh, current uh, technology could help us to understand our uh, decision-making process in ethics. So I was interested in neural basis of our morality, also interested in empathy. I had a publication on empathy and neural basis of morality. Uh, and then this, uh, I was already like very philosophically inspired, but this postdoc really uh, put me in the, in the philosophical scene 
Yeah. And for that, I, not, I never came back from, to my, my previous career. So I just switched completely. I, I did a PhD in philosophy after this project. And it was in this PhD that I developed what I'm doing nowadays, that is my, my work earnings and consciousness. So how, uh, so when I, I was interested first in self-consciousness uh, and how we develop, not just as a self-conscious creature, but how self-consciousness is involved within moral agency, how we, uh, uh, our inner thoughts are connected to the, to our emotions, to empathy, to, uh, to develop this sort of creature that we reflect about their own actions and we reflect morally about their own actions. But then I, I realized that there were, uh, there was little work on the early stages that is how we first become conscious. Mm -hmm. And then this was what uh, this, my, my, my PhD in philosophy was an attempt to cover this field of, uh, how before we become self-conscious, how we become conscious. And there's, yeah. I defend the thesis on the development of consciousness. Okay, maybe I said too much. No, that's awesome. That's been a question. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Uh, uh, so I wonder, Claudia, um, I should mention that you you work in bioethics now at uh, New York University, which is which is awesome. I wonder, are you still interested in in self consciousness uh, and like the development of self consciousness, even you know, like in in infants or where that takes place, if that still takes place. Like, do you still think about that that question of self awareness or self consciousness? Yeah, yeah, I'm still interested in this in this question because I think, although uh, I think we we are born with uh, this conscious capacity, probably the type of consciousness experience we have, the conscious experience we have in the early stages, probably is a little bit different from when we acquire the capacity to reflect about our own. Mm. Our, uh, our own experiences, so in a, in their thoughts and in their experience, uh, and the reflection. When the reflection entering the picture, probably this changes the way we experience the world, probably the way we experience ourselves, and the way we deal with our emotions and our our uh, mental states. Yeah. So I'm interested, uh, not just in self conscious per se, but I'm not, I'm very interested in this transition. When self consciousness enters into the picture and how this shape are uh, in a different way. So, did you, so did we start monitoring our thoughts and then suddenly when we apply your language, this kind of monitoring expands in a fair potential or exponential way? Or is self monitor something that enters a little bit later in the picture? So, I'm very interested in the connection between our inner experience self-monitoring and uh, self-consciousness and how this connects with the position of language because probably language uh, uh, bootstraps is in a very high level. Okay, it helps to yeah. expand this in a, in, a, in a very different way. Yeah, so my, my audience will probably be so sick of me saying this because I say it all the time, but but I've I've studied a lot of Donald Davidson and his triangulation argument and he's got a very strong under a uh, place for language in, you know, uh, higher order thought type stuff. And, and he goes in deep on, you know, you need language to have propositional thought and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so just real quick, do you think language is like an essential component of self-consciousness or, or um, do you think non-linguistic animals could be, you know, self-aware, self-reflective, self-conscious without language? Yes, this is a great question. So I didn't know you were, uh, Interested in Donald oh, Davidson. So I used a lot of Davidson in my uh, first PhD. My, 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 uh, I didn't know how we develop our, uh, uh, introspective capacity. I think his model of triangulation, as mentioned, is a very useful model to think about oh, yes. how we start uh, referring to the world and then we then start to refer to ourselves and how language might play a key role. Mm -hmm. Although I totally agree that for us, uh, linguistic creatures, the acquisition of a language plays a central role. I mean, I believe that we can have self-consciousness in all creatures, well, probably a kind of a different kind of self-conscious process, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, probably with uh, what we call non-conceptual uh, content. Uh, but I can also think that maybe animals have some kinds of primitive concepts that there's not kind of concept that uh, do not uh, 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 require language. So it's not a linguistic concept, but a kind of representation that might uh, play a role in the way they monitor their own behavior. Okay. Okay. Uh, but although I think that language uh, put the, the, at least bring to the, the picture something that uh, is is completely different to you, and I I think that it turns a good model like this. All his idea of how we are from all language acquisition and uh, this relation between you other and an object, you are the world. Uh, we uh, develop. But our capacity to reflect about our, so our thoughts, to refer to our first order uh, uh, thoughts with a high line of thoughts, but also the idea that this creates a particular and specific kind of intersubjectivity experience mm -hmm. that probably are any uh, 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 creatures that will have a uh, uh, linguistic capacity like that. Okay. okay. That's awesome. That's so cool. I, I love that. I think maybe. Uh, we can we can broach that again when we get to uh, to AI type stuff. But I, I was hoping um, because the panel was on non linguistic uh, conscious beings, uh, you started us off and you talked about infant consciousness. Uh, can you can you lay out the the distribution problem for us and the and the problem of infant consciousness? Uh, can you motivate it for the audience to see why why it might be a difficult problem? Yeah. So uh, so it's. It's good what you said, motivate with the problem, because usually we, we treat newborns and we treat infants as if they're conscious. So this, they, they come to the world and we pair their uh, niche, uh, developmental niche as if they're conscious creatures. So we avoid them kind of very uh, uh, uncomfortable stimulus for the babies because we are already expecting them to feel something. But although we have this natural way to relate with them, um, and other than so they're conscious, it's very hard to, okay. So most of what happens is that we're inferring that they're yeah. conscious, but we don't uh, or have like a final evidence that can really prove that they're conscious. Uh, we also know that at a certain point uh, during development, they become conscious because of our own experience. Okay. So we know that we are conscious. And sometimes in our development, we become conscious, but where, when this time happens to the babies, it's like the first day when we are, we are born in the womb or the first month, the second month. So the question okay. is, uh, uh, that I think is relevant is, uh, is, no, is, is, is the development methodology that might help us to understand the what it is to be able to identify to detect when creatures that don't have a uh, verbal approach or capacity to tell us that they're conscious, when those creatures are, or become conscious, or not just become conscious as the conscious creature, but what kind of conscious experience they have. For instance, animals might be conscious, but are they conscious of the same type of, of uh, conscious experiences that as, as adults have? We don't know. Are they uh, seeing the world uh, the same way? They have the same conscious process, or maybe some process that are conscious in our might be unconscious again. So this kind of the, the distribution problem uh, you mentioned. So this question question has been designed by, uh, by those who are studying, who are studying animal consciousness. And the discussion is how consciousness is distributed among creatures. Um, that don't have verbal reforms. They cannot tell us that they're conscious. Okay. Right. So how uh, consciousness is distributed in a large group of people, of the group of creatures, uh, that we cannot easily detect their conscious state. So in the, in the animal consciousness studies, the question is related to the origin, where in the evolution of the panel of 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 the and the kingdom for the consciousness of large day okay, is with vertebrates or before vertebrates and vertebrates are insects conscious or not, are fish conscious or not. So there is this, this question, but it can apply this distribution questions in not many and more about that 
your range but of cases that is broader than this. You can ask uh, uh, patients in vegetative state exposure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Serve so yeah, no, organ no, no, no. lines, uh, AI machine exposure. Then you can also apply a big difference, uh, an instance of this case, the distribution problem. So, why this is it a big problem? Is usually we start with the case of handbots and mask happens, or incursions, or object, or incursions of this visual experience, this visual health. Uh, Stimulus that is present to you, and yet the adult can say yes or no. Or even if they cannot say mm -hmm. musically, they can indicate with some action, uh, like pushing a push button or something that can tell us that they need to uh, conscious about that stimulus. In those, in those cases, that uh, if we don't have verbal reports, we do not have any kind of indication if the creature is conscious or not. So my daughter, we have some behaviors in infants that indicates that we might push this kind of trigger evidence that in fact in the case of that does lie in the case of it. I call this the problem of the infant brains, and there's the problem of how we can roam while uh, conscious or stimulus. Okay, so it's a version of, we can think of this as a version of the distribution problem, but also a version of the problem of all brains. How can we go? That's someone else that's not just yourself, part Okay, so so that's the problem of of infant minds. Um, there, there. Uh, I, I think maybe to to continue motivating some people will say, well, um, it's just kind of intuitive. You can see a baby's crying, and you can just intuit that it's in pain. Uh, an infant, uh, he or she is in pain. Um, how come in in your talk you said that third person methods are insufficient for determining infant consciousness. Can you go over maybe some, some third person, uh, methods and then maybe why, why they would be insufficient? Uh, yeah, you, you're right that infants, uh, have many behaviors that is uh, very, very similar to us. Okay. And I totally agree that intuitively, uh, I would attribute consciousness to them. Pain, you think, this is a case I'm very interested, the case of pain. So I would, uh, 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 in, a, in a more intuitive way, believe that they are in pain, okay? Uh, however, uh, there are many processes uh, in our minds that are unconscious, okay? Mm -hmm. We have many cases where uh, we process uh, stimulus uh, visually, uh, all, all, in all kinds of sensory modalities unconsciously, okay? Uh, and it's not just so easy to uh, to the term without verbal report, without this kind of subjective uh, uh, um, report, if a creature is uh, perceiving that stimulus consciously or not, okay? So get the case of pain because uh, pain is, is interesting and then uh, uh, is a is a is a. I, I get pain as my um, my paradigmatic case of conscious experience to to discuss babies. Okay, yeah. and why? Because uh, uh, I'm interested. Uh, just I think it's for the audience. It's interesting to say a little bit. I'm interested in uh, what we call phenomenal consciousness, so subjective experience. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that babies, that we don't have evidence that babies have minds, they have minds, but I want this kind of subjective experience as we have when we uh, we perceive the world, okay? Together with our the function of our mind, we also have this kind of subjective experience that correlates with uh, the way our brain is processing the world, okay? Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, uh, when we uh, we are sleeping, we're still processing many uh, information, uh, mostly from your brain and our body, but you're not process, process those information consciously, okay? Yeah. And when, when we are awake, we start processing again those information consciously. So I'm, I'm interested with this kind of, of conscious experience that we process. Mm -hmm. and, and for babies, uh, they cannot tell us, and you cannot, different from animals, because most of the primates, we can train them to push a button or to give, to indicate with their behavior that they are conscious. Right. And it's very hard to train infants because they don't have a very good motor control. 
we will see that most of the studies that try to uh, to show evidence of consciousness in babies, they usually use uh, either their mouth control, because uh, the first area we acquire motor control is through our, uh, for the sucking process. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they also use the eye track uh, uh, behavior that infants have, because limbs, legs, and hands, we are still developing this kind of control. So it's very hard to train them to at least indicate us that they are feeling something. Uh, so in the case of pain, uh, there are many behaviors that uh, that uh, that we usually adults have in response to pain that are behaviors that can um, be perf performed unconsciously. Okay, so uh, and we can also have pain without those behaviors. I can control to not show uh, that I'm in pain with my. Uh, I can control my face, facial expression, okay? I can control my uh, my motor reflex to avoid showing that I'm in, with pain. Uh, but there is one a kind of behavior, there is a kind of automatic reflex that we usually have uh, when we are in pain. That we we usually, if I, if I touch uh, uh, a heat, uh, a very hot stove, my my hand will uh, retract or withdraw the uh, the reflex before uh, before I even have uh, uh, conscious information of, of that pain. Okay, right. so we can use facial expressions. We can use this kind of withdraw, uh, limb withdraw, hand withdraw, leg withdraw movement to test if infants have those uh, reflex, and they have. Mm. Okay. Uh, you can see that they, they have facial expressions, and they have what we call uh, pain crying. They cry in a way that is similar to the way an adult would cry, if uh, the specific kind of crying. Because, you know, babies, they cry for everything. Right. They cry if they're frustrated. They cry if they're hung, uh, They're feeling hunger. They cry in many... Uh, uh, even if uh, probably if they are feeling okay, if they are a little bit stressed, they can cry. But you can still distinguish some types of crying. There is one specific uh, that they call pain, call pain crying. Babies have uh, those behavior responses. But uh, if there are evidence that you can isolate those behavior responses, and those behavior responses can correlate with the cases that there is no brain activation of the pain areas. Okay, So those behavior responses can be completely unconscious. Hmm. So a baby can uh, have a, 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 the similar, similar facial expression of pain in the womb in cases that they might not be feeling pain, might be just be their developmental process to start doing this kind of expressions. Okay, yeah. Baby can also have this reflex, that is this automatic withdrawal of their limb, to retract their limb in the case that they are feeling pain. Uh, they use a lot of this uh, heel prick. You you touch their heel with uh, something that might cause a little bit of pain in the heel, and they uh, they have this limb withdrawal uh, movement. But those uh, uh, behaviors can be present in cases where there is no clear brain activity that indicates that the baby is in pain. And they can also have those withdraw, the limb withdraw reflex in the case of just with a tactile sensory information. Yeah. They are not having a noxious stimulus. Noxious stimulus is a painful stimulus. They're not having a painful stimulus, but they are doing this kind of limb withdraw yeah. because they are, we are touching their skin. So you can see that the evidence is a little bit confusing because similar behaviors can correlate with cases where we don't think they are feeling pain. Yeah, uh, Claudia. So, so to follow up, uh, what what is pain? Can you have non conscious pain? I know, like in the film mind literature that I, that I like to read, it's always C fibers firing, and everyone goes, "It's not actually C fibers firing," but that's kind of like a stand in for what what the uh, neural correlate of that conscious experience is. Um, can you can you have non conscious pain? Um, because I know, like a, a I don't know how many behaviorists are still left around, but there, I think there's probably still some. But they, they would say that that pain behavior, in, like that, that is the pain. Or maybe like a functionalist will say, 
um, yeah, you know, there's the input and then there's some kind of state maybe, and then there's the output. And so it looks like that just is the pain. That's the realizer. But like a dualist will say, well, pain is that qualitative experience. So it looks like you can't have like non-conscious pain. I don't know. Any, any thoughts on like what, what a pain is? Is it an ouch or, or something else? Yeah, this, this is an excellent question. First, I think some people would say, uh, but it's a, a, a few people would think that there is a case of unconscious pain. Okay. 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 Um, but I, I will set aside this discussion if there is a unconscious pain because it's a little bit more complex. If I can have a subjective experience of pain that is just unconscious. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the majority of people would agree that pain involves two processes. One process that is what we call a nociceptive process, and the other process that is a subjective uh, feeling of pain. The nociceptive process can be disconnected with the experience of pain, okay? Mm. So all my reflex of withdrawing limby with a draw or remove my, my hand from uh, a, a painful stimulus can happen without no brain process or brain activation that mm. would give uh, rise to pain experience that would be correlated to the feeling of pain. We have, a, 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 we can, in our organism and also in uh, most of the vertebrates or at least mammals have this, you can disconnect the uh, the reaction to pain. There is a reaction to what we call noxious stimulus. That is a kind of automatic process yeah. from the subjective experience. Okay, so when we call this, they can detect that something is harmful before we have another connection of a, a, another uh, neuro activity that goes to the brain and tell us this is painful. Mm. or that is this kind of, of uh, pain experience. Yeah. So in this sense, we can have a kind of, of unconscious processing of pain, okay? Yeah. That, is, uh, uh, that is this kind of sensory recognition of pain that can be isolated to the affective process, the feeling of pain, okay? Yeah. So there is a question, when babies have this facial expression and when they have this uh, reflex uh, uh, of the, the limb withdrawal that they have. Is this a reaction to the uh, sensory reaction to, to uh, noxious stimulus, the nociceptive part of the pain? Or is this the, um, the, uh, the subjective experience of pain, right. okay? Right. So one way to disamb disambiguate this uh, would be to look to the neuromarkers of consciousness. A baby, the babies have the same areas of uh, pain active, uh, narrow areas of activities when they are in pain that we adults have. Right. Uh, this is one question. Okay. And uh, this also involves what we call uh, third person methods. I can say a little bit more about the distinction in a moment between yeah. first person and third person method, just to clarify. But they, the question is, do they have, together with these behaviors, do they have any kind of neuroactivity that indicates that the brain is in pain? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to find the neuromarkers of pain, even in adults, different from the case of visual experience. Visual experience, we have the visual cortex, we have the auditory cortex. For pain, uh, during many years, we thought that we have a kind of pain matrix. But this idea has been, uh, uh, been less and less convincing. So there are many evidence that some areas, some cortical areas of the brain are activated in the, in, uh, with pain, but it's also activated when we are not feeling pain. It's activated when we, ha we have any kind of stimulus that is salient to us. So for instance, a very loud sound I can activate the same areas I would activate if I feel pain. Uh, so it's very hard to show that one area of the brain is actually dedicated exclusively, is specific to pain, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we have is areas that we usually correlate with pain but correlates with other kinds of, of, uh, uh, of experiences 
uh, the organism is having. So those evidence isolated, the behavior evidence, evidence of the neuromarkers evidence uh, isolated, they might be not too strong to make the case that infants uh, are feeling pain. So as skeptical, as you said, as skeptical can this, oh no, this is not, those behaviors are just not susceptive processes. They are not conscious experience of the affective process. And the skeptical about the neural markers of pain can say, oh, this is not the pain matrix. This is just another kind of process that is happening in your brain that mm -hmm. is a kind of confound. You think that it, the brain is uh, uh, registering pain, but the brain is just registering, registering or decoding some salient uh, process or detecting some salient process. Yeah. But what I try to do with my, my thesis is show that all this evidence together uh, is uh, those, if you put those, those three, uh, 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 so babies, they have the same behavior, they have the same uh, neuroactivation, although this, those areas are not exclusive to pain, they are involved in pain and they are necessary for pain, those neuro areas that we find in adults. And there is a nice uh, study showing that base, babies have the same areas activated, uh, neuro areas activated when they are in pain. So although those, uh, the evidence isolated might be uh, not too strong, if you put all the evidence together, I think we have a strong case that they feel pain. Okay. okay. <laughs> All yeah. this a big, <laughs> yeah, so go for a big process to claim yeah. that maybe they feel pain. Uh, we can also correlate this with theories of consciousness and neuromarker or, 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 and also criterion for consciousness. I can say yeah. this a little bit in a while. Yeah, you know, I'd love to follow up on, on uh, the skeptical challenge thing and, and just maybe address or, or broach. Um, it's, it, the problem of infant consciousness seems like it's, uh, it's downstream from like the problem of other minds where it's like, well, how do I know that you, know, you Claudia have subjective experience? Uh, someone close to you has, uh, brought into the literature, philosophical zombies. And so, you know, maybe, maybe you're a philosophic zombie. And so does, does, um, f uh, making an argument from be pain behavior, does it just say, Hey, look, like, you know, let's, let's bracket off the problem of other minds because that might be like unsolvable if you're looking for that kind of thing. Or uh, is there any implications from uh, arguments from uh, from pain behavior that can help us with the maybe more fundamental problem of other minds? Uh, yeah, I think maybe I could say a little bit about uh, how I think we, we could. Um, so in the case of adults, we solve the problems of other minds uh, asking for uh, for others if they are seeing a stimulus or not, or if they are having that uh, experience or not. Okay, uh, there are some uh, 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 solipsists that think that we can just know about our own minds. Right. Okay, um, but I think we have, uh, and so just me, I, I'm just the only conscious creatures in the world, and everyone else is a zombie. This would be the solip solipsistic. Uh, uh, um, picture, okay? I think we can uh, get out of this solipsistic picture through verbal reports. If, a, if, the, if an adult that have a similar brain as mine, and if they are capable to react in a similar way and give reports in the sim similar way, and uh, uh, is his part of the same kind of species I am, I think we have a reliable way to attribute conscious to this creature. Okay. Uh, in the case of infants, the the question if there are a philosophy of zombies, uh, a zombies uh, uh, arise is because we don't have this verbal report that can mm. confirm or not if they are feeling pain or feeling any kind of other other experiences. So you think, okay, they might have the same functional profile, but they might not uh, uh, be able to to feel pain because we cannot have any kind of indication that they feel pain. And more than that, some, um, some philosophers and neuroscientists uh, sometimes think we need a kind of uh, a high order cognition to be able to feel pain or be able to uh, have conscious experiences. Yeah. So I'm more in the camp of people that think 
that we can have uh, conscious experiences um, without this kind of higher cognition. But it's I don't I don't want to appeal to this uh, to my uh, my credence in theories of consciousness to make my case that infants uh, uh, feel pain. Okay, so this yeah. theories of consciousness we enter uh, later in the picture. So yeah. just to, but, but I would like to reply to this because I say okay, a functionalist might say that they have. So for the functional profile, we have first to show that they have the same pain area, or at least the same kind of neuroactivity that we have when you feel pain, that they also yeah. have when they feel pain. Okay, so we still need this uh, uh, behavioral markers and um, neuromarkers. So I think this might allow me to say just a few words about my methodology. Yeah. So I think we start with, um, with the adult case. Okay. What happened when an adult feel pain? What kind of a behavior the adult have has when they uh, when they feel pain, and what kind of neuroactivity they have? So from this we can extract behaviors and neuromarkers that correlate with conscious experience of pain, and see if the babies have those behavior neuromarkers. Okay, uh, so we combine first person methods from the adult case with and third person methods from the adult case because you're also observing the adult extract a neurocorrelates of consciousness and apply this neurocorrelates of consciousness in the infant case okay the babies have the same kind of behavior that correlates with, with conscious pain the baby has the same neuromark the same brain activity that correlates so they have the same neurosystem that decode pain in the adult case that would decode pain, could decode pain in the in the infant case, okay? Yeah. And from this, we can uh, uh, infer as uh, the best explanation for those behaviors and the best explanation for those, this kind of brain activity that they are in pain. But it's still an inference to the best explanation, okay? I hope in the future we'll have a better measure that will detect immediately if mm. others are conscious, maybe yeah. a conscious, <laughs> A, a, a way to 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 measure conscious more directly. Yeah, once once uh, maybe once Elon Musk makes the the Neuralink or something like that. But I I like that you said it's inference to the best explanation because that that preempts uh, some of the skeptical uh, worries or concerns that pop up right away. I'm thinking about like Hillary Putnam's uh, super super actors and super Spartans who whether or not those are possible or not, it seems like they are possible, but they may not be plausible. But if an infant was like a super actor and gave all the physical signs of being in pain while not actually consciously being in pain, yeah, that's one explanation, but it doesn't seem like it's the best explanation to, to think that infants are these like super actors who are pretending to be in pain to fool us. Like, well, what's, why is that a good explanation? Yeah, so I, I think this kind of, 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 of worry uh, it's less, uh, at least it's less compelling in the, in the infant case. I'm not saying that could not. I think yeah. it, this, this kind of problem is more compelling, for instance, in the case of, of machines that we'll discuss, uh, we can discuss later. Because in the case of machines, we are training them uh, to behave in a way that simulates our behavior, okay? If, if infants were developed to simulate pain, it's, it's something that evolution built in in their program. Uh, so, but, 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 uh, but it's very hard to, to, to think that they are super actors that are trying to deceive us <laughs> that they are feeling pain. I think their behavior is, their behaviors are spontaneous behaviors, okay? Mm. Uh, what we, we don't know, and I think this is uh, other things about the, the, the case of infants, uh, is if those behaviors actually correlate with the kind of brain structure that is required for pain in the uh, uh, in the uh, adult case, and the kind the type of brain activity that that would be expected in uh, in, in the adult case. For instance, in the womb, we know that there are some of those behaviors. They, in the womb, they can already do some facial expression and they can already uh, do some automatic reflex. Yeah. But uh, they don't have all the structures, the bank structures, uh, that the cortical structures that seems necessary. At least, I'm not saying that cortical structure 
is necessary per se per, for pain because maybe some animals feel pain without cortex. Right. So I, as the case of fish. So I, I, I don't want to make this robust claim, but maybe in the case of humans, the cortex might be a, a necessary structure that should be involved in pain. So we need cortical structures to be developed uh, for infants to feel pain. And they might not have this before the third uh, uh, semester of gestational age. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is really I don't know good. if I, I convinced you. Maybe you can still <laughs> come with the continent. <laughs> okay. So. No, that's, that, no that's, that's really good. Um, well, let's go on. And if you want, I can say a little bit about flexible behavior that I think it's another evidence I, I, I use to to, to uh, another criteria for pain that I use to make the case that they might feel pain. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this, you can. Yeah, please, yeah, let, let's bring it all in, yeah. Yeah, just, just for us to conclude the pain case, Yeah. <laughs> say a little bit about flexible behavior. So uh, so there, there is one criteria for consciousness that might be, uh, we can apply uh, uh, together with those behaviors uh, that infants have, one question is, are those behaviors just automatic behaviors, reflex behavior that would indicate nociceptive pain? Or does those behaviors, there is, or, or whether there is a way to detect a kind of conscious process involved in those reflex behaviors, apart from the, the neuromarkers that I, I read brought into the pre picture. And I think Michael Tai developed this idea of flexible behavior that I think is interesting. So a behavior to be a conscious behavior has to be available for, uh, for the, the creature to respond using different kinds of, uh, of strategies, okay? Hmm. So a behavior is flexible if I, in feeling pain, I use many kinds of strategy to get rid of the pain. Okay. Hmm. In fact, you always use the same strategy, the same behavior. My behavior is not flexible, it's a rigid behavior. Okay. Hmm. And rigid behavior might indicate um, uh, automatic behavior. Okay. I just respond to the same things all the time. But if I'm flexible, if I change different, I'm feeling pain and I change my strategy to avoid that harmful stimulus, this indicates that I have flexibility. And flexibility seems to correlate with have, having the, uh, the mental state available for different systems in the, in the mind, in our mind. And this is one of the criteria we can, uh, uh, that some philosophers have come have that might be a criteria for consciousness, availability of the information in our system. So I feel pain and this information is available for motor control, if available for action, is available for some kind of cognitive process that might be involved. So, for, so if you can find that those behaviors are not rigid behavior, but they're flexible behavior, you might indicate that infants have those flexible behaviors. Then I make the case that pain behavior in infants have flexibility or have this flexible marker that Tai uh, says that has a marker for one, one, one potential marker for consciousness. Okay. Is this, um, so it's a potential marker for consciousness. It, is it like a, is it like a sufficient condition? Cause in, in my head, I'm just thinking like, what if you're like, I don't know, uh, like if I'm a disembodied soul and I don't, it, you know, I, maybe you think I can't feel pain if I'm disembodied, but I'm trying to think of like an, a, a situation where someone would maybe be mental to, pain. <laughs> yeah, where 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 you can not suffer able, mentally. Right, right, but but the flexibility. But no physical like, pain. So you feel disembodied. Okay, okay. Physical pain is what's in what's in view. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, that's really good. So um, so that's Michael Ty. Um, that's that's fascinating stuff. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. It seems you were to collate one question oh, no. about this embodied creature. No, that that's that's good, and it might have some implications for embodied cognition and, and embodied, uh, you know, consciousness type stuff. Um, well, I, actually, I want to I want to go on to um, theories of, of consciousness because you you give in your talk 
uh, you you listed two approaches to infant consciousness. The one we've been just discussing this this uh, whole time here, uh, and and building up kind of an argument from pain behavior from you know scientific research and stuff uh, that's measurable, third third party uh, type stuff. And then you also include uh, theories of consciousness, both philosophical and scientific. And then you list uh, two of each, two philosophical and two scientific. And I, I love these. I'm I'm very fascinated by these. But I want to introduce more and more to my audience. Um, are you able to to broach those for us? Can we maybe we start with uh, philosophical theories? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah. Maybe one way to enter with uh, philosophical theories is. Um, uh, so I, I think in some cases that the theories are more have a more uh, uh, um, um, they are more relevant than the others. I think maybe in the case of of animals and uh, creatures that have similar sensory uh, uh, process than us and have similar behaviors, you might uh, uh, if you find. A good correlations between neuromarkers and behavioral markers, I think, uh, uh, can help us to indicate that they are conscious. Uh, but if you don't have, I think, theories of consciousness, I think it's very relevant in the case of infants. But I think also it would be, and uh, we will discuss, uh, we can discuss this later, but it would be very relevant in the case of AI. And I can see a little bit more why. Okay, in yeah. cases you don't have, maybe this is what you have in mind and you say that this embodied uh, mm -hmm. creature, a creature that might not have similar behaviors and sim similar neuromarkers. So I think theories become very relevant in this case because they might isolate a, a sufficient criteria for consciousness, as you uh, uh, mentioned, that might help us to indicate if the creature is conscious or not. Okay. So, so my second, I started with this strategy about a neuromarker and a behavior marker, and I put, I, I, uh, I, I think a second strategy to, is to rely on theories of consciousness. So, how does this strategy strategy goes? So, the idea here is we uh, we see what the theories of consciousness tell us about the criterion for consciousness, and you see if we can find this, that criteria for consciousness, or at least if infants or animals, if they pass the test of the criteria for consciousness that the theory is requiring, okay? So in this case, I don't, uh, so we don't, it's not all theories of consciousness that offer us objective criteria for consciousness, okay? Yeah. So I, I uh, uh, in my approach, I try to select, so I, I, I don't, go through all the theories, I select some theories that give us those criteria for consciousness. And through those criteria for consciousness, we can uh, see if you can make the case, uh, if most of the theories, if the upshot of most of the theories are that infants have the, uh, at least can be, uh, 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 can have the, the type of criteria for consciousness they are, uh, 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 they are indicate if you can, with that criterion for conscious, predict if the infants are conscious or not. Okay, yeah. and using those theories to make those predictions. Okay? Yeah, I, I think and you can also was... later use the case to test the theory. But I can talk about this later. That's that's really fascinating to me because, um, yeah, maybe you take, maybe uh, it's like a Morian fact or something in in your view, not your view, in in someone's view that. Infants just are conscious like that. You're not going to disprove that to me. But I have this philosophical theory of consciousness that would preclude infants from being conscious. Maybe that's reason not to affirm that philosophical view because you have something more that you're more sure of, which is that infants are conscious. So I think that's really fascinating and it's really helpful for uh, for theoretical virtues and picking which theory you're going to use. I, th I think that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think so. If if the theories pred, uh, have, uh, if if in all cases where you have some credence that the, the creatures are conscious, if the theory fail in all uh, in all those cases, you probably have less uh, 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 less reasons to believe in that in that theory. Okay, right. uh, but I'm not saying that uh, this will uh, refute the theory completely. But at least you you, you raise for a problem for the theory. Yeah. The theory might have a way to accommodate or to revise 
the criteria for consciousness in a way that would accommodate the case or yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so in your talk, you you uh, you you looked at two philosophical theories: first order representationalism, and then um, a higher order thought, like a category of of consciousness. Can you lay those out for what? What do those mean? Uh, yeah, I can say a little bit more uh, about those theories. So the theory, the first theory is uh, the idea that uh, consciousness is uh, uh, is a is a first uh, first order state. Okay, so I have this. Uh, uh, I represent the world. I have a stimulus that is processed in my mind, and uh, once I represent the world. Uh, I'm conscious of that representation, okay? Yeah. And there are different, the, uh, the first order of theories come uh, in different versions, okay? I discuss one specific version because I think it's a version that, become, that became very popular, although we have uh, other ways to think about first order theories nowadays, yeah. but I think Michael Tai's panic theory was a theory that was uh, that was relevant for at least explain what, how would be uh, uh, how a first order uh, uh, representation could be conscious. Okay, yeah. so he has some criterion for why uh, for how those what would be the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the criteria for those for a first order state to be conscious. Okay, so not all in every kind of first order states we have. We are conscious of, of those states, okay? Right. So a conscious state is the kind of representation state and represent uh, something in the world. And for instance, if I'm seeing a red object, I represent this object as red and I have a red experience in my mind, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the conditions for, uh, for, a st for this state to be conscious, this state has to, uh, to be available for me to react Okay, so if I'm seeing, if I'm trying to, to imagine I'm trying to find a red object in yeah. my, I don't know, a red paint in my table. If I see red and I pick up the red, oh, this is, I don't have any red things here. Maybe there's kind of reddish, brownish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this is the brown, brownish object I'm, I'm, I'm searching for. So it seems that that representation, seeing this object and this representation is available. Uh, uh, in my system, then I can think about this, the object I'm searching is this object, okay? Yeah. So the representation has to be poised for uh, action and cognitive control, has to be abstract and non-conceptual. Uh, I think the idea uh, they have here is I don't need concepts to see things in the world. Mm. So I can see shades of colors that I don't have concepts for that shades. But I can see, see a variety of shades, and it needs a kind of intentional content. Okay, yeah. so so they so in the sense that I'm representing that state. Okay. So the uh, the question here is whether infants have this kind of representation of states. So this if they if they um, if they meet the criteria for panic. Okay, yeah. and I make the case. Uh, um, in my article on infant conscious that they they uh, they can meet this criteria. They have uh, uh, actions that shows that they uh, they represent the world uh, in an abstract way. Uh, it doesn't need to be con it doesn't need it's not conceptual because they don't have concepts in early right. stages. Sure. And it's poised for action. I think the most relevant uh, part of the criteria in the case of infants is whether this uh, this information uh, is poised for action. Is the idea that is available for me for acting according to that state, okay? So yeah. if I'm searching for something red, I will use that information red to pick up the object. In the case of pain, if I'm feeling pain, I will use the information of pain, the experience of pain, to change my behavior in a way that will avoid uh, that uh, painful stimulus. So yeah. this is the idea of being poised, is available for uh, cognitive control and action control. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds right. It sounds like, um, yeah, on, on that theory, 
infants are conscious. Um, uh, uh, so higher order thoughts um, seem to be a little bit more like uh, intellectualized or like uh, like more rationalistic and 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 uh, positing maybe some capacities that it looks like infants maybe don't have. Um, so what do you make of of higher order? I guess maybe real quick, what are some higher order uh, theories of consciousness? What what does that entail? I guess what what are those families? Yeah, I think the, so. High order theories can come uh, in different versions too, and I think uh, uh, this uh, the, the upshot of if they predict or not of infants con infants are conscious, it depends on the way the theory is uh, 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 developed, designed. Uh, so the idea of high order theories is I need a second state. So so remember the first order theory is. I'm having a mental state, there's a state to represent the world and I'm conscious of that property in the world, okay? Yeah. The higher order theories will appeal to a second state to make that first order state conscious, okay? So consciousness is a kind of relation between the first order state and the higher order state in the case of higher order theories, okay? Yeah. So a phenomenal conscious mental state is, uh, uh, is conscious if there is a state uh, uh, that is object of the high order presentation. So the high order presentation is a kind of state that say, oh, uh, you're conscious of this state, okay? Yeah. And it can come in a different versions. Some versions uh, don't uh, create problem for infant consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of self-representation. So the state represents itself, so I don't need a uh, extra layer of cognitive process. Yeah. But there is one uh, a version of the theory uh, that is that requires a kind of second layer, if I can say, of cognitive process that might impose problems, that might pose problems for infant consciousness. Yeah. With so, with those theories that, that have um that are like self uh representational, are what's like the, what's the intentionality there? Is it like does the intentional arrow or whatever like loop back on the first order like uh mental state yeah so i think the idea of self-representation of theory one of the authors that defend this is raya Kriego, is that the state itself is represented uh uh there is a loop of representation in the same state okay okay so i'm conscious of a state if that state uh, can be represented. So a phenomenal conscious state is a state which represents itself to the person who is the subject of the, of uh -huh. the state. Yeah. Okay. So the state is representing for me, has this idea of for me-ness, I'm representing the state for me, for the subject, yeah. okay? So mm -hmm. it enters into this the picture, this kind of self-representation of that state. So that yeah. that state is for me, for my perspective. Okay, is it, it sounds but, kind of, but is I that think like it's a, a theory that I can still accommodate with infants. Uh, sorry. Okay. Well, I, it, to me, I uh, I have uh, some friends that are like phenomenologist uh, philosophers of mind, and I think they kind of go in for some stuff like this with with like a dual dual intentional yeah. state, where like there's the the intentionality goes out towards something being perceived, but it also kind of loops back, because I I think um, yeah, I don't know if if there's ever just like a pure pain state, right? Usually it's like, I don't know, something's poking me and that's causing me pain. And there's, it's, it's, I don't know if there's ever just, maybe there is, but just like pain. I'm just having pain in my experience, right? And so it, it seems like there would have to be more like a looping arrow and then like a, another intentional uh, arrow going towards something else. Yeah, this is interesting what you're saying because I think if, if you can compare theories, the first order of theories is saying pain. I'm feeling uh, feel, feeling of pain and I can be conscious of feeling of pain. Okay. can have some uh, uh, consciousness related. But the self-representation theory is uh, that pain has to be for a subject, for me, pain for me. Okay. Yeah. So I'm feeling pain, but I'm feeling that this pain is for, uh, is there is a kind of, of this self is represented to the person who is feeling pain. Okay. Yeah. 
So a state which represents itself to the person who is subject of that state, okay? So it requires a kind of, some kind of metacognitive ability because it's for the subject, okay. but I think it's very minimal and we could still accommodate with infant consciousness. Infants might have this for meanness, this perspectival consciousness yeah. uh, since they are born. Uh, but the high-order theories, the classic high-order theories, like Dave Rosenthal's uh, high-order theories, might be a little bit more challenging. I'm not saying that uh, they cannot accommodate the theory, because there is one version of the theory that could be accommodated, but it requires a high-order stage that might require high-order cognition. Okay, yeah. And we know from brain development and also for... Uh, uh, psychological development that uh, high order cognition entering the picture a little bit later in development. Okay, so uh, so through this theory, I'm not sure that the theory can predict early stage. The two early stage, I'm really think about early stage, the two first months of life. Okay, yeah. this might pose a problem for the theory if in that moment we already have this kind of higher cognitive capacity. Yeah. Also because this theory, the high order theory is a la Rosenthal's view, um, claim that uh, infants, uh, claim that the, the high order state is a kind of a conceptual state, okay? Yeah, right. There is one version that the theory uh, proposed by Ho uh, Rocco Gennaro that says we can have a kind of a very primitive concept, concept that even animals have. And we don't need kind of, of conceptual, uh, uh, a more linguistic concept. It has to be just something very, very primitive. Might yeah. be a way to accommodate infant consciousness. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Ro Rocco uh, has been on the podcast before. For listeners, uh, go check that that episode out with him where we just talked. Actually, I have his book right here, uh, Consciousness. And uh, oh, yeah. that was great. Yeah, I, I love that guy. That's, yeah. that's a good one. I can, yeah. I can see very briefly, he has this idea. I first feel, feel pain, and then the pain is kind of a demonstrative concept. This, I'm feeling this. So this this kind of layer of uh, cognitive ability he thinks we need for feeling pain is this that I'm feeling. Okay. Uh, this is the layer of, of the thin layer of, cogn of cognitive ability might be required for the theory, a kind of demonstrative concept. So I don't yeah. have the full concept of pain, but I, I'm, it's, a, it's as if the system is saying, I'm feeling this. So and, this and is the same as I'm feeling before. And are, uh, do you think that infants have that demonstrative uh, concept of like this, quiddity, this, thisness type thing? I think it's plausible that they have. Uh, my only uh, resistance to this idea is that for having this demonstrative thought, I first have to have a kind of experience of pain. Is the uh, first experience of pain already a demonstrative uh, concept or there is? So it, it creates this kind of, of uh, original right problem of the yeah. first, first concept, when the first concept is developed. Right. Is my first experience of pain like this, this pain, or this is a problem for the theory? And yeah. if if I needed a demonstrative to have a demonstrative concept that can be a very basic thing, like just recognize that I'm feeling the same thing. This is the same feeling. Yeah. Um, is my first experience of pain involving the sameness recognition? Or my first experience of pain has no experience at all because yeah, there is right. no recognitive or demonstrative concept. <laughs> but if it, if so it has I just no think there's a puzzle for the theory. Right. Because if, it, if the first pain doesn't have any experience, then the second one can't be like that because you need that in order to like latch the second one onto. But then the third one, yeah, so that's... That's fun. That's really fun. Yeah, so at least they, they have a problem to to explain how this first concept is yeah. developed. Okay, yeah. so I yeah. need lots of love, lots of of experience of pain without conscious experience to develop right. the, the, this primitive concept or not. But anyway, I think I think this is a problem. But I I I think the theory might be able to accommodate 
Okay. I, I have this optimistic approach with the theories. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, Rocco, if you're listening, come back on the podcast. Let's talk about it and, and share with us uh, how you can get past it. I wonder about, uh, I, I'm pretty much only familiar with Rosenthal's hot model, uh, higher order of thought. I always thought that it, it didn't, it didn't seem very plausible to me and who am I, right? But it didn't seem very plausible to me to, uh, to explicate like phenomenal consciousness, but it seems like a good model for self-consciousness. Like, uh, uh, I'm self-consciously aware of, uh, a first order, uh, thought if I have a second order thought about it. And since you, you've done stuff on self-conscious, what do you make of applying like a hot model toward, you know, uh, toward self-conscious awareness and stuff yeah i agree with you that uh, uh, can be very useful to understand self-consciousness but also very used to understand self-monitoring how oh. i'm monitoring my own states sure sure okay yeah. uh and i think it's a theory that uh, might be uh, uh might be interesting to understand how I develop some confidence that I uh, that I, I am in that state. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, but it can relate to this with self consciousness because I think some some self monitoring is involved in self consciousness. But nowadays, I think metacognition has been uh, uh, expanded for beyond yeah. um, self consciousness literature in consciousness. So I think it's a very good model to how we develop some sort of metacognition. Okay. That's awesome. Well, uh, I want to respect your time here. So I want to uh, keep us moving. Uh, we got some philosophical theories. Now uh, there's two scientific theories that you broached in your talk, integrated information theory. And we've had Garrett mint on to talk about some of that. And he goes in for ontic structural realism with some IIT type stuff. Um, and then also global workspace. And both of these theories are super fascinating to me, but a lot of my philosopher mind type friends, they focus on the philosophical theories and they don't really touch the scientific stuff. So can you help us out with the, uh, with these two scientific theories of consciousness? Yeah, I can say a little bit about, uh, uh those theories, although, uh, I'm not a specialist on, on IIT and, and Garrett, oh, sure. he has much more to say than me. So whatever I'm saying here is, uh, please go to his podcast and, yeah, yeah. and uh, so, uh, for, uh, his ep episode on your podcast to to get a better flavor of the theory. My mm. my flavor, my take on, on IIT. Uh, 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 I'm not a, 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 a big. Uh, 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 it's not my 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 strength in, in the theories. But yeah. but IIT is interesting because uh, so for IIT consciousness is identical to a sort of inter integrated information. Okay, yeah. so they suggest that we have like a, a mathematical measure phi that represents conscious experience, and from this they can derive predictions about which circuits in, in the brain are necessary to produce conscious uh, experiences. Okay, so consciousness we va varies in this theories in quantity. And for them, it comes in degrees, okay? okay? And this will correspond to these different values of phi, okay? Uh, so they, they aim to explain phenomenal consciousness and phenomenal consciousness will be determined by this totality of information or relations uh, within this, uh, this integrated complex of, of, of of information that is um, our mental states. So, so the question for for infant uh, for infant consciousness is if the theory can predict if they are uh, conscious or not. Okay. So, mm -hmm. given their uh, uh, their brain uh, and the way they process information, if the theory can predict or not, uh, if they will have enough integration in their brain. To uh, to have a conscious conscious brain, brain yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's plausible to think that babies have like some degree of integrated information, okay. And this degree of integration information might be higher than the subsystem of the brain. And this is enough for the theory to postulate that they are conscious because uh -huh. the integrated uh, information theory say for 
for for having conscious experience, you have to have a system that has uh, phi higher than the other subsystems of the brain. Okay, okay. and I think uh, brain infants' brains have enough integration uh, for this requirement of the theory. And if they have uh, some degree of information that uh, integrated information that is higher than the subsystems, the theory can predict that they they are conscious. Okay. But the theory can also predict in this theory as consciousness comes in decrease, the theories can also predict that they are less conscious than adult. Okay, Be oh, yeah. because probably we'll have like a, a low level information relations in the brain than we have in the case of adults. Probably adults have a more higher level complex relations than infants, okay? Yeah, because so it comes I in think the, yeah. It comes in degrees. And also yeah. probably uh, the type of activation that is required for an integrated uh, informational process. Mm -hmm. uh, so adults' brain probably have the sort of activity or much more activity than the infant brains. So we know, for instance, that our uh, uh, the brain, the infant brain, is, is still uh, uh, developing their uh, their synapses. Okay, so they are not completely activated in the beginning. So there are many activations that will come later on. Uh, so we can predict it probably that they have uh, the, the relations between uh, those systems is less complex. Than the relations we have in the case of um, of adults, I would love to have a, a, a paper on uh, not me, but someone from IIT. I would love if uh, I would love if they they try to uh, to study the infant brain and come with a, a, an interesting uh, discussion of this measure for the theory. Uh, so this is what I'm uh, uh, or have about about IIT. Is much more my rudimentary uh, uh, knowledge of the theory and uh, how I can make sense of how the theory could predict if infants yeah. would be conscious or not. But they actually don't have any, at least uh, as far as I know, um, anyone in in the in their group trying to to apply their measures to the to the infant brain in the oh, way wow. the infant brain is is constructed maybe in the future because nowadays infant consciousness has become very popular so i'm sure yeah very they, soon we heard it here some... first yeah folks get get on it and uh and make sure if you do and this becomes your research project or dissertation you got a site dr uh claudia passos here on the parker's oh, pencil podcast too. yeah let us let us get a little footnote here that'd be great <laughs> um Okay, I really like what you're doing too, by the way, by um, just go exploring different theories and saying how they might uh, uh, explain infant consciousness and why it might be, a, you know, if they can't, why that might be a concern or why they might need to adjust it or they could they should consider adjusting it. The, the last one here, uh, global workspace, uh, I think is probably going to be least well known to my philosopher friends and probably most well known uh, on like the AI research type type side of things. Can you help us with this one? Yeah, I think global workspace uh, have some interesting things about infants, and I think is the uh, is the theory so far, uh, at least among those the the, the scientific the I'm I'm being a little bit unfair. There are other scientific theories that are trying to. I think Antonio Damasio's uh, uh, theory and uh, Bjorn Merker's theory. They are they have they offer some options that are interesting to think about infants mm. too. So I don't want to exclude uh, uh, those potentials, uh, uh, those other scientific theories. But I think global workspace is a theory that try to to test their theories, uh, uh, their their uh, their measure of consciousness in infants. So I think it's a theory that we can discuss with more, uh, at least with more details, what the theory says says to okay. us. So, okay, so the uh, so for 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 global neural workspace theory, the brain has a kind of global workspace mm -hmm. that involves sensory areas and frontoparietal areas that is associated with attention, 
And their idea is once you have like a stimulus, the stimulus has to enter in this global workspace and be broadcasted. This is the expression they use. The information has to be broadcasted in this gro uh, broadcast in the global space to give us rise to consciousness. So the consciousness is the global availability of this information to different systems uh, in the brain, okay? So the stimulus uh, entering the cortex is propagated and when the system is, the, the stimulus is consciously perceived is when a certain threshold of awareness is crossed, okay? Mm -hmm. And when this our awareness, threshold of awareness is crossed, this correlates with some specific activity that they can measure. They call this measure P300. It's a kind of slow wave, okay? And when the brain has this specific wave, P300, that they can measure, this correlates with when adult says unconscious with the stimulus, okay? Mm -hmm. So from this, they can extract one measure that seems to be necessary and sufficient for consciousness, okay? And uh, the lack of this P300 activity would show lack of consciousness and the presence could show presence of consciousness, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I wonder about, I wonder, like, how, how easy does this make sense of, of infant consciousness? Um, is this like an active, uh, is this an active thing that the agent or the subject is doing? Are they, I mean, it seems like it's probably passive that just the brain is doing this by um, amplifying the, the stimulus or, or spreading the stimulus um, across, broadcasting the stimulus across the rest of the brain. Is this something that that infants can do, that uh, dogs can do? Like, does this make sense of consciousness in, in non-linguistic animals? I think it depends on how what uh, what is required for this neuromarker. Okay? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, and I think this is what they. It depends on the kind. Is do this neuromarker correlate with some specific brain structures, anatomic brain structures? Does this neuromarker correlates with some uh, spe specific structure of the brain, or this neuromarker could be found in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the animal uh, 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 or in, in any kind of animals, or would we need some sort of specific structure to yeah. find this neuromarker? So one thing and. And I think this is one of the reasons that nowadays this new this P three hundred wave is uh, is becoming less convincing as a, as a hypothesis. Even the even those are, uh, that work uh, with uh, those who work with the global network space theory, they are less they are using less of this P three hundred as a marker. Okay? okay, because there are many studies nowadays that shows that this P300 might correlate with my verbal reports when I say I'm conscious of the stimulus and not oh. with the consciousness with the stimulus, okay? Totally, yeah. So they found this P300 reply more specific to a question in animals, in primates, okay? That have some sort of, uh, or at least higher primates, uh, monkeys that have some sort of, of higher cognitive processes. But surprisingly, they didn't find in the early stages of newborns. So there is a nice uh, uh, experiment conducted by, uh, by uh, the hands, uh, send the hands uh, uh, lab that is, uh, uh, that is one of the pro uh, proponents of the, uh, of the, of the neural work, uh, global workspace, uh, the global neural workspace theory that uh, shows that infants in the early stages, the first three months, they don't show, this P300 don't show up in their brain activity, mm. okay? okay? So they tested infants from three months, five months, and seven months, and this specific wave appears in, uh, in infants with five-month age, but not in early stages. 
And if this is a narrow mark for conscious for the theory, it would mean that infants before five months, if it's a necessary and sufficient condition, would mean that infants for five months, they are not, uh, they are not conscious of, of the stimulus. Um, they, they tested with facial recognition of uh, a per perceiving faces. That is something that infants can do pretty early in their development. We are capable to, to recognize faces. Yeah. So there is a, a nice discussion about this evidence, and I discussed this. I, dis I, I discussed this in my presentation, but also discussed in, in my paper uh, that there are uh, some uh, evidence that the P300, as I said before, correlates not with conscious experience, yeah. but correlates with uh, when I'm reporting, when I'm telling others that I'm conscious of the stimulus. Okay, mm. so it would be would correlate with a kind of cognitive process of reporting my conscious states, and if I don't have capacity of reporting the states, probably this measure uh, won't capture. If I just have yeah. the conscious state but not the capacity to report, as in the case of animals, and in the case of infants, um, this measure will not reveal this. Um, my conscious states. Okay. Yeah. It, so I discussed it, this theory and I tried to. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No. No. No problem. No problem. It it seems like there might be a nice analog in uh, free will literature on like Libet's tests, where they're they're looking for the stimulus in the brain to see, but it's really more self-reporting. Uh, I don't know. It's debatable, right? I don't want to step on anyone's toes here, but it seems like there's a nice uh, analog in in that literature as well. Yeah. So w one way to describe it is is. Uh, when I first, when the, the stimulus first entered in, uh, in the, even in the global workspace, they might be, they might have an early process uh, that happens when the stimulus entering the cortex. That is before I'm capable to report, but I'm already conscious of that state. Yeah. And there are some nice uh, evidence uh, in some experimental paradigm con paradigm conducted by uh, Michael Pitts, showing that. If you, we uh, give uh, the subject some tasks, uh, some tasks performance, uh, this uh, this P three hundred might not. Uh, uh, if I distract the subject with other stimulus, this P three hundred might not show up, oh, even no. in adults. Okay? okay, so it indicates that I can disambiguate the conscious experience with. Uh, the emergence of the P three hundred. Yeah, okay? that's fascinating. Yeah, wow. Okay, um, this is so good. I, I gotta keep moving us uh, towards some some uh, AI stuff. We could each one of these we could spend you know the whole time on. This is so good. But some of the people are here just for the AI stuff. So I want to broach that really quickly at least. Um, actually, before we get there, we talked about how IIT says. Um, Information, integrated information theory says that consciousness is kind of like a spectrum or comes in degrees. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Do you, do you think that consciousness is more like a light switch? It's flipped on or off. And then like some point in development, it's just on and it's a fully full, full bore. Or is it like a gradual stage where something can become like more or less conscious? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm less convinced about the consciousness as a credible property. Uh, hmm. So although I think I to give uh, uh, this possibility, uh, I would think maybe, I think you can be more or less conscious about, uh, uh, about some stimulus. For instance, probably when we are dreaming, I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming, I, I have less, I don't have conscious of the, external world i'm just conscious of my own dream yeah uh, so i can be less or more or less conscious uh but not i'm still a conscious creature okay yeah so man. i would uh I, I know that panpsychism and iit gives uh, uh um but it's just just like my I, I i'm more convinced that maybe we don't know when conscious enters in the picture there is some indeterminacy when they enter, but probably uh, there is probably in the future we might be able to say, okay, the system is conscious now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, instead of thinking that uh, 
But the fact that the system is conscious now, I like the idea that maybe the system is conscious, not in the same way. I might have like full awareness of everything that has happened. Maybe if I'm using psychedelics, my awareness might extrapolate. I might be aware mm -hmm. a lot of things. Right, right. Um, and probably when I'm sleeping or when I'm still awaking, or maybe if I lose some sensory capacity, a blind person, or if I don't have auditory information, or if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm born with less capacities of, maybe this there is less, uh, how can I put this? Maybe um, I'm conscious of less things in the world, but I'm still a conscious creature. Right, okay? right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, as as a you know someone who works in, in bioethics as well, uh, I'm wondering about consciousness and the implications for moral status. Um, is is consciousness rooted in uh, moral status? Do you think like is that what what gives us moral status as being conscious beings or potentially conscious beings? Yeah, I. I, I like very much this question. I, I think conscious uh, has intrinsic value mm. and a, a conscious creatures is a, a creature that has moral status. Okay. Mm. I, uh, I think there is, uh, it brings value to our lives mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's something that's relevant, but that said, I'm a little bit pluralist regarding Motor status. Okay, right. so I don't think that conscious is the only thing that gives us motor status, gives us or any kind of creature. Okay, so I would be uh, uh, um, willing to accept that creatures that are not conscious, like a philosophical zombie, yeah. but has other kind of psychological capacities, that those creatures also have more status, okay? Oh, okay? So a creature that has agency, intentionality, um, I would think that this creature uh, has a more status, okay? okay? So, but probably, although I think this creature that does not have a philosophical zombie that behave like me can have uh, more status, I, I would disagree uh, that uh, I would think that a creature, the same creature that has the same capacity of the of the of the philosophical zombie, if that creature is conscious, has more moral status than the philosophical zombie. I think the con consciousness brings to the picture something that uh, that makes that creature with more valuable existence mm. than the philosophical zombies. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is really this is getting us right into the AI stuff because, um, like, yeah, if if so, um, because you're a pluralist about moral status, uh, well, would that include would that include uh, would that include artificial intelligence, uh, artificially intelligent beings who have some of the other criteria you mentioned, like agency and and stuff like that? Would would they have some kind of moral status? Uh, yeah, I think I think AI can have more status. Okay, okay. Uh, if they have uh, first, if they have the uh, some psychological features that you think make their lives uh, give them interest, or if they have goals that can be frustrated, huh. uh, if they can um, have have other kind of psychological features that bring value to their existence. Okay, yeah. but again, I think if that creature has all those psychological features, and if you compare that uh, the same another creature with similar psychological feature, but that other creature is conscious, I think the life of the other creature with consciousness plus the psychological features, uh, it 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 matters more. If I can okay. say, yeah, okay? yeah. So AI yeah. with psychological features can have uh, some specific psychological features can have consciousness. I don't think consciousness is uh, ne completely necessary for any kind of motor status, uh, okay. but I think it brings something that makes you count more. And if you think in the if you, if you have to attribute rights and 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 motor status. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, so um, that's super fascinating. I, I, I really appreciate that distinction. Let's say that, well, let me ask you, do you think that we can make uh, phenomenally conscious machines? Do you think that's like metaphysically possible? Yeah, I think we can make. I, I don't endorse the view that biology is necessary for consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think uh, uh, usually, uh, uh, so we, we can have uh, um, some, I don't know, empirical constraints to build a, a, a conscious AI. I don't know if we would be able to, to, to let me say, to uh, overcome those constraints. But sure. uh, since last year, everyone is more optimistic <laughs> yeah, that right. we might be able to overcome those constraints because yeah. they are they are becoming um, more and more capable. But uh, but this uh, so far is more about intelligence. But it raises the the question if we will, will be able to um, to to also create an intelligent creature, but also create an intelligent creature that uh, if through those, this improvement of the machine and the creation of an intelligent machine, if this intelligent machine will, from this process, will emerge, will, will emerge as a conscious creature, okay? Yeah. But that said, although I think we can um, uh, create uh, uh, a conscious uh, machine, Probably this the type of consciousness they will have might be a little bit different yeah. than ours. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe in the future we would be able to create conscious creatures that is a kind of um, uh, that comes with the base of a biological brain. You know, this idea that we will replace neuron by neuron and I will create. Um, <laughs> a, 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 conscious creature, but, uh, but if you think about the large language models that is at least so far the most advanced system that you can predict, okay, this could the system be conscious in the future? So I think if, if large language models can be conscious in the future, it will be a kind of consciousness that is different from our consciousness. Yeah. Probably a less sensorial consciousness and a more cognitive consciousness. Mm. So uh, probably all the things that I was saying that the infants lack, the kind of higher cognitive capacity, probably this is what they will have. They will be like this kind of cognitive consciousness. Hmm. Um, and I haven't been discussed, I didn't present this in the MindFest, but I presented three weeks ago in the uh, American Philosophical Association panel on modest status and, uh, and AI animals and oh. I, I'm trying to apply the same methodology I developed for infants in the case of AI and see if we can come with a sort of a developmental perspective yeah. on, uh, on AI consciousness. Well, that's, that's funny. That was my next, my next question, actually, because, uh, because in, unless the uh, machine that we're taking to be conscious, unless it's like a direct isomorph of the human brain, it looks like, like how, how would we go about finding those those correlates? Because in a in an infant, you can look at their adult brain and you can see do they have the same uh, level of development or even areas. But if it's not a an isomorph, how how would you go about saying like, oh, here's the pain receptor area? Uh, I guess you could say that you could talk to the programmer or the the engineer and say this is what we designed to be the pain area. But it would be if it's if it's not isomorphic, it's like well, how do we know, right? Yeah, this is a very good question. So, so I think in the case of AI, um, so remember, I started saying we have two strategy for the fact if infant, uh, uh, infants are conscious or not, yeah. uh, relying on animal consciousness studies. So have like the neural and behavior markers of consciousness. And then we start for the adult case, we extract the neural correlates and see if the neural correlates uh, correlates with similar behaviors and similar similar neuromarkers in infants, yeah. uh, and then we can make the case that they are conscious, and we can bring neuro uh, theories of consciousness to the to the picture too. You're right that in the case of machines, we don't have 
At first, the behavior markers are very misleading yeah. in the case of AI. Okay, they can uh, they can actually simulate it. And uh, um, a, a recent piece by Christian Andrews and Jonathan Birch, they call the, the gaming problem uh, uh, based on what Alan Turing says, uh, let's create a, a, a system that can and imitate us. Right. So machines that might imitate us and might be misleading their verbal reports. They could be Contrary, super uh, yeah. They, yeah, they could be the super actors you mentioned before, yeah. and this can be mis misleading. So behavior reports doesn't help here at all, okay? Mm -hmm. A, a behavior response, okay, because they and the kind of verbal reports they can give us. Uh, neural markers are not not a good guidance too, because they have a. Comp Although we can say that the computational process is a little bit similar, we can think about we are developing a, co a, 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 a connected system with activity that, in certain way, mirror uh, uh, the computational process of the mind. Yeah. It's completely different. They're not made for the same biological uh, stuff, and we cannot really extract the same same things. So in this case, I think that our best approach is theories. We we mm. need what uh, Jonathan Birch uh, calls a theory have approach for AI. So it needs yeah. really to use theories. So theories might be a good guide, and again, global uh, workspace theory might be an interesting in this case. So maybe we should try to create an AI uh, with a global workspace or with a kind of uh, either, uh, uh, I forgot her her last name, she was in a, in a panel, uh, just try to find it, Ida uh, Momenajet. Hmm. Uh, she suggested in a, in a panel on the Philo Philosophy Deep Learning Conference uh, three weeks ago, uh, AI needs uh, executive control, a kind of prefrontal cortex yeah. It'd be interesting to see if you can build a machine with a prefrontal cortex and a, this kind of executive control and see if it is, if at least they have the psychological features I said before that would correlate for us with some some kind of, or at least behaves as some kind of agent. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm not optimistic that we might be able to... Uh, to, to develop at least uh, 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 a machine with a similar kind of, of uh, agentive process that we have. Hmm. Uh, through this, we'll, does, does this will give rise to conscious or not? We don't know. But at least, uh, as uh, David Chalmers said in one of his, uh, uh, I think in the Mind Fast, he was talking about this. At least you, you have now a research program to test uh, mm -hmm. if AI in the future will be, but at least try to, to develop those those creatures right. or not. Yeah, totally. He gave a, a great paper on on LLMs and how we might evident how we might have evidence for and against them being conscious. Um, I want to preempt. So just just finishing up here, I want to preempt some of the comments that are I'm sure going to be happening already. A lot of uh, so I, I I work a lot in. Um, philosophy of religion and a lot of the philosophers of religion kind of just take for granted that uh, uh, Ned Block, your colleague and uh, like John Searle have, have kind of knocked down machine functionalism and that machine functionalism is necessary in order to have conscious AIs or strong AIs or whatever. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, do you think machine functionalism is necessary? Uh, does that have to be the proper theory of mind in order for us to have conscious machines? And uh, also like, what do you make of, machine functionalism, do you think, or just functionalism in general, I guess, do you think that's the, the theory of mind? Uh, I think the problem of, 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 of functionalism, uh, I, first, I, I want to separate functionalism from behaviorism, okay? Yeah. So maybe machines might behave like us, right. uh, and this might not be a good guide for consciousness. But if they have the same functional profile, I would be more optimistic that they could have the kind of psychological features I'm, uh, I, I was telling uh, before. Yeah. The question is, does this, this give rise to phenomenal consciousness? Uh, so Ned Block, for instance, would say no. He thinks that we need biology for this kind of, just the functional profile 
will not give us uh, uh, phenomenal consciousness. I think even if, uh, at least probably, I don't know, access consciousness might be there or some yeah. kind of cognitive consciousness might be there. Sure. Uh, so I would be a little bit more more optimistic in this yeah. sense. But I don't know if, if, I, if I, I totally reply to your question. Well, um, do you do you think that uh, do you think some form of like functionalism or machine functionalism must be the actual case in order for us to develop AIs, or could some other theory yeah. of mind, uh, yeah, also be the case? Uh, what, what kind of theory of mind do I have in mind? Maybe, maybe like like panpsychism, or I, I I used to I used to draw this line a lot more, but I'm I'm more of a substance dualist myself. But some of my substance dualist friends say, "Hey, look, if there are psychophysical laws, like uh, Dr. Chalmers uh, mentions, then perhaps we could, by by chance or on purpose, hack those psychophysical laws and and produce a soul in a robot, or you know, immaterial mind in a robot, or emergent theories of mind where, yeah, maybe you can make like an isomorphic." Uh, it seems like multiple realizability is true, probably. So maybe you just have a different substrate and things that play the same roles as the different lobes or hemispheres of the brain or whatever, and consciousness emerges out like a magnetic field or something. So in my head, it seems like a lot of different theories of mind can give can be true, could be the, the, the actual theory of mind or whatever, and, and we could still have conscious robots, phenomenally conscious robots. Yeah. I, I would agree with a more pluralistic uh, picture mm -hmm. that multiple uh, 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 theories uh, might might help us to create those uh, mm -hmm. um, a consciousness in robots. I yeah. think what might be relevant is just like as I, I think we should start with ourselves. Okay, so what I I, I think this is in, inescapable. So what makes us conscious? Uh, and what kind of, of systems we might be able to reproduce uh, in, in, in robots. It's true that evolution uh, uh, created consciousness, not starting with us, and different systems. In Some people has, has, has been proposing that we should, for instance, study insects and see mm -hmm. how they developed. And this would be much more informative for us as a, mm. a, a way to think what is missing in, uh, in machines. So in this sense, I would be less rely on theories. I would be more relaxed on investigating different kinds of markers or biological markers in the, in the evolution and try to, uh, to reproduce this. I yeah. still think, I like the, uh, 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 the idea, but I still think that we, it's unavoidable to start with humans, adults, what makes our conscious, and if it's possible to reproduce this kind of of um, uh, of at least what we think that is missing in the case of robots in robots robots. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, uh, recently uh, uh, um, Yasha Benjel was suggesting we should have a global or at least try to have a global workspace. Uh, in robots, a kind of system one and system two, yeah. okay, one one system that reasoning very fast, but also system that will reflect about your own kind of self monitoring system that will reflect about your own, and the global workspace would give this reflective loop that will monitor your own states. Yeah, and if you could build these machines, it would be like a, a, a path. A, a, a direction. In the, yeah. you're, you're, you're asking a more metaphysical question. Uh, and I think would be, I, I would endorse less a view that I, I'm trying to navigate my methodological discussion without <laughs> committing myself with, with right. any metaphysical view. Yeah, and you're, in the end, you're pressing me, you're pressing me in the end. Okay. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> I'm a much more. Uh, uh, I don't take any stance in those uh, metaphysical positions. Okay. Uh, but I would be more sympathetic with the view that uh, would be possible to uh, to accommodate uh, AI and machine consciousness. Okay. okay? Yeah. That would be possible for us to uh, to recreate 
uh, in a system or either, either reproducing uh, the same kind of, 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 of physical laws we have in our brain in a system, okay? Yeah. Or maybe through uh, uh, IIT and panpsychism will suggest this with a different, uh, uh, probably less reproducing uh, us and trying to see if we can uh, create a system that can have some kind of integrated uh, information that could yeah. give a rise to, to our... But, but I think all those theories, they always start with us as... Uh, as the first step to generate, at, even even if even if you not consider neuromarks and behavior marks, even if, even if you think about theories of consciousness, yeah. they to postulate to the global workspace to postulate um, an integrated information, the the measure uh, uh, that IIT proposed, they all start with the human case, or either the adult human case, our own consciousness. Right. right. With and and what you're doing here, which is great, is is also keep an eye on on uh infants and how the theories uh will impact whether or not you know we, we take them to be conscious which we do um two last questions very brief one do you think that ai will put philosophers out of business uh seems like there's already a tough time getting a job as a philosopher i'm i'm uh working on my lord willing i'll, I'll go on to do a phd in philosophy finishing up a, a master's here um, is there going to be any jobs left? Like, there's, it's already a tough marketplace, but is AI going to take over and and uh, put philosophers out of a job? Uh, I don't know. Maybe in the future they will write theses for us. <laughs> uh, I, okay, yeah, I I, I I I teach a course on, on ethics of AI, and one of the uh, of my of of uh, of the things I discuss is. Um, automation and if you will lose your, our jobs or not or if you will should decide um about our jobs if you are if it, if, if it should prove our jobs ai proof see if our jobs will be could be protected or not and usually i i there is one website you can uh, describe your um uh, your career the, the the things you're doing and they will say do they predict uh, if huh. uh, AI will replace this or not. Is it AI uh, doing the prediction? I, uh, it's an algorithm that does the prediction, oh, but that's the prediction. Be yeah. <laughs> but based, based in, in what kind of profession uh, would require some kinds of abilities that the system, the, the algorithms don't right. have. So this idea that if you have some, if your activity requires lots of, of uh, relationships that require some emotional components, uh, things that we have to interact with other humans in uh, intersubjective or care, uh, professions that require some, some care relations. Um, but also uh, I go to the website and they usually say that, that academics and teachers will be always, yeah, they are protected from this. Okay, that's but nice. all this, all this was before GPT four. <laughs> okay, that's, so now that's... GPT four, we don't know. Probably right. will. I, yeah. I'm not completely confident yeah. because they they might very fast overcome our capacity yeah. to uh, to do all sorts of of cognitive operations we have been doing. Uh, I think philosophy that uh, I think for philosophy, we ask fundamental questions. So I don't know, it might still have a job for I us. So. Yeah, I, uh, so. I don't know if we will have academic jobs because probably right. they will teach our problems better than us. But yeah. I, maybe, maybe what, I don't know, some questions about life and death, mm. some questions about religion, mm -hmm. uh, some questions about what, yet, what is ethical or not. Yeah. Maybe this will be if they don't if they're not conscious. Maybe they won't be able to discuss the same level of uh, deep level we have when when discuss those those these, those issues. Yeah. But probably all the other stuff. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Train them to teach our students 
everything we are reflecting, they probably will do better than us. <laughs> yeah. We'll come with much more interesting way to teach our students hmm. than us. So probably we might still have uh, uh, a safe place for a philosophical reflection, but not no jo no academic jobs. I don't know. Right. I'm just yeah, speculating yeah, yeah. a lot. Well, I'm, <laughs> we I'm glad to, you yeah. say I'm so glad to hear you say that the, the philosophers of religion and the bioethicists and the, the uh, yeah, we still will have jobs, metaethics, all that stuff. Uh, last, last question, uh, just a shot in the dark. Do you, are you familiar with the, the uh, soft drink uh, Guarana? Guarana? Yeah, you know yeah. It's a Brazilian uh, soft drink. It's the best. I just, uh, I do yeah. jiu-jitsu and my, my jiu-jitsu instructors gave it to me. Oh, you do so Brazilian jiu-jitsu? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing now your your T-shirt. Yeah, you can't okay. see my ears. My ears are hidden with the thing, but I got some cauliflower ears. Um, so that means if we got AI and we make them phenomenally conscious, they may steal our philosophy jobs, and they may, since guarana is delicious, they may drink all the guarana too. So they have left nothing for us. So that it seems like we might have a bleak future here. Are you optimistic or pessimistic uh, about the future with? The advancements in AI. I, I'm by nature a little bit optimistic. Maybe it's a problem. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing. <laughs> Maybe the, the the pessimistic crowd they are more like I I I think. Look, I think uh, any kind of technology can be uh, can 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 raise some uh, ethical concerns. Okay, and of course, this technology raise huge ethical concern and and i understand those that are uh, all this movement trying to uh, refrain the development of this technology mm -hmm. uh, i think also uh, i don't know if, if ai will like guarana probably they will not have uh, the, the same sensory capacities or the same taste we have i don't know uh, in what direction at least language large models so far they don't have what we call sensory grounding, they are not uh, probably will will uh, uh, adapt a language large model in a robot with the same cap cap sensory capacity as us. But this is uh, at least I think a little bit far away. Yeah. Uh, but I can see the the uh, the dangers of and and as a bioethicist, I'm always concerned about this. Not just this. I think uh, Susan Schneider also has this idea of the global brain, how we could not just, there is one concern is how those models, the large, large, large language models will develop, but it's also, there's also concern about uh, how our minds will be, we interact in a kind of global connection. She has this idea now, now of a global brain, okay? So I think there are many concerns and I think we should be very careful uh, I have this uh, optimism, but sometimes optimism can be uh, uh, can be naive uh, a little bit uh, uh, for the, the, the potential dangers. So I'm aware of the potential dangers. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so I think we should develop the systems in a way that uh, that we we at least we we have we have more clear. Uh, 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 at least we are concerned about the, the potential dangers. Okay. It's, yeah. So it's a mix of uh, of optimism with um, with uh, uh, some realism. Uh, mm. We should be realistic of the of potential dangers. Okay, yeah. and, and how we could protect ourselves. Should we stop referring to create those systems? Uh, I don't know. I, I still didn't see a, a, a strong arguments that could endorse complete completely that we should stop completely yeah uh, but maybe maybe soon we'll have uh, some evidence that will okay maybe we should stop maybe we should reconsider our i'm open also to someone that could show me uh, more realistically what are the, the potential dangers yeah yeah well this has been this has been so awesome uh claudia thanks so much for for all your hard work and for giving us so much so much of your precious time here uh i learned a bunch i know my audience is going to learn a bunch um i will put a link to your website in the description so people can find out more of your uh stuff uh just again thank you so much for for all your time here today 
Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And thank you for the great questions. Include the final question that I I didn't, uh, was something that I'm not really completely, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, a, but, a, but it was a provocative and interesting question to think yeah. about uh, yeah. the future of all this technology. Yeah. And thank you for this. Uh, I'm looking forward to see the, uh, the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Well, folks, that's going to have to do it for us for now. This has been Parker's Pensies and as always, all glory to God.